because I think we have one of our more interesting questions that we've been able to ask recently. And it's because I've been talking to a lot of folks about the offensive line uh, class in this 2024 NFL draft. And the question is actually pretty simple, which is, do you think the Washington Commanders should trade up into the first round for an offensive tackle in, oh my God, it's next week. I can't believe I'm getting on a plane to Detroit a week from tomorrow. That's because I'm not. It's a, I'm going Thursday morning. So a week from two days from now. And in, in, in nine days, I'm going to Detroit. That's... Time flies, man. That's nuts. Um, but we've been talking about... like We had Dane Brugler on Take Command. Um, we chatted yesterday with Mike Golick Jr. Like We did almost 30 minutes on the O-line uh, with, with Gojo. And that will be out in the morning. And I've obviously been continuing to read a whole bunch of people. I've been listening to so many podcasts. I simultaneously am so over this draft and can't get enough on it. I just keep listening to stuff from people I like who are smart. Uh, and I actually, we had joked about this with Gojo because like Mike just, or like Mike referenced Nate Tice uh, and, and talking to him about something. And Nate uh, and Mike had just been on with, or Nate had just been on with Mike and then they were both doing something with Mina. And like, it's just all of us are talking to each other at this point. It's a giant echo chamber of us all having each other on, on our shows and talking about the same uh, college football players. But um, I, I think the more I've dug into this offensive line class, the less conviction I have about potentially trading up. Um, so before I give my reasons why... And if I ask you this question before giving any extra information, any any of my latest download on the offensive line class for 2024, based off what you know from doing this with me every day and in your own watching and reading and listening, how interested are you in trading up for a, a offensive lineman in the 2024 NFL draft if you are the commander? Trading back into the back end of the first round. I'm super interested. Super interested. Um, I just feel as though being able to shore up, you know, your quarterback position and all, and also your um your your left tackle or you know your blind side, um, is important. And if we're building towards something, it's important to you know have that centerpiece. And also, you sort of kind of get it at a cheap expense. You know, left tackle, quarterback, those are two positions that are you know highly uh coveted and you got to really pay those positions nowadays and th if you can get those two positions at a relatively cheap price right now while building towards something I think it's your best bet. So, I this okay, more questions actually. More questions before information and opinions. Okay. Would you do it for anything other than a left tackle? No. So no guards, no centers. No. Um which obviously makes it center especially right now because Washington decided Biotish who is genuinely their center for the next hopefully three uh, contractually but hopefully he signs an extension and he's the center for the next five to eight years yeah. uh, based off his age and experience and, and all of those things um, right tackle not interested not no. valuable enough to you no okay so we're talking about just left tackle left yes okay how high oh well, it's not even how high are you willing to go it's what are you willing to give up Right? Are you willing to give up 36 and 40 to get a left tackle? Where am I landing giving up 36 That gets you and 40. into the late teens. I think I would be interested. I'm okay. not saying I'm I'm all in, but I would be it's intriguing to me. Okay. Um would you give up one of those plus one of the I guess 60, 67 still in the third round. So 30, 36 and 67 uh, for, I guess 78 is too, but let's say the, the higher of the two. 36 and 67 to get into the early 20s. Yes. Okay. So that interests me too. 36 and 40 is a non-starter for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to give up both of them unless something crazy happens. Exactly. Right? We don't know how this draft is going to fall. We don't. And it also depends on what you think. I think there's one scenario where that becomes potentially feasible, and I'll get to that scenario in just a moment. Um, if you want to go ahead and start calling in, by the way, to get your 
take in on this Vibe Check Tuesday for this conversation. 301-230-0980. That is, of course, the Team 980 listener line. 301-230-0980. You talk to Ant, he puts you on hold, and eventually we put you here on the radio. Um, But what I would say is... 36-40 36 and 40 is too rich. And we're actually going to talk to Alec Lewis of The Athletic coming up at 5 o'clock about a piece that he wrote, which essentially comes down to every bit of research available says trading up is stupid. That you are just better off taking shots and having more lottery tickets than thinking that you are smarter than everyone else and that you are going to nail one pick over two. So trading up is almost never the right option. But... There are some exceptions, and quarterback is certainly one of them. And I think if you can get a franchise left tackle, like that's worth a lot. That could be worth two players. Um, and it does come down, uh, as you said, to the contract values. Like a good left tackle will cost you $30 million within a couple of years. Like that's realistically where we are with that position. And so if you can get him for five um, for the next five years, like that's amazing. Um, so 36 and 67. I think I'm more willing, but I don't think that the list of guys, because then it also comes down to like, how likely are you to get that, that pick right? And that's where I think some of this logic falls apart with this class in particular. One, there is no true stud at the top of this class. Joe Alt's really, really good. But if there was a stud left tackle, a Trent Williams, et cetera, he would be taken above these wide receivers, right? As good as Neighbors and Harrison and Adunze are. For positional value, if there was a stud left tackle, most mock drafts would have someone going before seven, right? So you're already talking about an A-minus guy at the top in all, as opposed to an A or A+. plus. So that's thing one. Thing two, everyone below him, there are major questions about. From inexperience to, I don't know if they're actually a tackle. They might be like Troy uh, Troy Fatanu from Washington. A lot of people really, really like him as a guard. It's like, he's definitely a good NFL player, but he's probably a guard. Guard. Um, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm getting at. So, What's the situation where I would consider trading up into the teens? What's the situation? Who are the guys that I would really consider falling into the 20s, being aggressive to go get? And and is it even worth it considering what might be available to you at 36 uh, and or 40? That's the discussion we're having on a Vibe Check Tuesday. Do you think the commanders should be trading up and be looking to trade up for an offensive lineman to support their franchise quarterback that they will take Second overall, 301-230-0980. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and always live on the free Odyssey app. How aggressive should the commanders be in trading up in the 2024 NFL Draft? They've got two seconds, three-thirds. Can they package some of them to get back into the first round? And should they package them to get back up into the first round? 301-230-0980. 0980. Let's take your calls on this vibe check Tuesday, starting off with JT. JT, get us going. Thanks for calling. You're on the Hoffman Show. Hey, what's up, uh, Hoffman? How are you? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Appreciate it. Um, personally, I, I would not uh, be be willing to trade up um, unless just something crazy happened uh, where where you got. Like Olu, you know, drops down, and you know, excuse me if I messed up the pronunciation, um, or you know, I know Alt's not going to be there. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it's too many question marks uh, when there's still a lot of good talent at other positions. Um, so I, I would rather just sit at 36, um, 36 and 40, and try to attack attack it there. Whether that's you know Patrick Paul, whether it's uh, the guy from Arizona. Uh, or even the guy from uh, Washington, I think his name was like Rosengarden or something like yep, that. But, yep, Roger Rosengarden. Yep, that, that, that's what I would be looking to do. Um, and question, what, what what are your thoughts at 40 if uh, Keon Coleman is there? I know he didn't run the fastest 40, 
But I think, yeah. you know, if we get Daniels or whoever we get, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, you got it, JT. I'm gonna let you do the uh, the hang up and listen bit. I, JT hung up himself before I could even click the button. He he hung up, and now now we'll listen. Um, I'll get back to the the tackle thing in a second. Coleman's super duper interesting. Um, I've heard people that love him. I've heard people that hate him. I like him. Um, I'm not gonna pretend like I've spent a ton of time studying him, but like when you listen to the people and understand why they do or don't like him. He's a guy that I tend to go, like, he was pretty good and he's pretty productive, and I think he's going to be able to figure out how to do the same thing in the league. Um, he's a big X. Um, you know, I, I don't think Logan's super high on Keon Coleman. He actually likes, I think, his his teammate Johnny Wilson better as, like, a tight end power slot kind of guy. Um, but Coleman at 40 wouldn't be my top pick as a receiver, but if they draft him, I'm not going to blink twice. I think that's where I'm at on Keon Coleman. It's like... You get him at 67, amazing. You get him at 40, fine. Um, there's probably other guys I'd prefer to fall, um, whether that's A.D. Mitchell from Texas, Troy Franklin from Oregon. I really like the slum of the slot guys. Like, if Lad McConkey from Georgia falls, I am all over that kid. Um, but Keon Coleman's super talented, and there's there's a lot to like about him. I am with JT on the tackle piece, though. So I've got the beast pulled up in front of me, which is, of course, Dame uh, Brugler's uh, draft guide. Here's his rankings. He's got all first. Uh, Olu Fashinu, I believe, is the pronunciation there, although I keep hearing different people that are genuinely experts say it totally differently. Um, but Fashinu, uh, who, by the way, D.C. kid, went to Gonzaga, blocked for uh, Caleb Williams. Uh, Fashinu from Penn State, uh, he's the second guy. J.C. Latham, third from Alabama. Fourth is Talisi Fuaga from Oregon State. Fifth, Amarius Mims from Georgia. Tyler Guyton, sixth from Oklahoma. Uh, there's that. So those are all the guys that that Dane Brugler from The Athletic has as a first-round grade, um, with Guyton being marked as first, second, not true first. Everyone else, the top five, all first. He's then got Kingsley Suomatia from BYU, Patrick Paul from Houston, Brandon Coleman from TCU, Roger Rosengarten from Washington, all with second or second third round grades. And then the last two third round grade guys are Blake Fisher from Notre Dame and Kieran Amadigi from Yale. Uh, and then you got a whole bunch of dudes who are fourth and below. So for me, Fashanu is the only guy that I would even remotely consider trading back up into the high teens for. He has got a ton of raw ability. He's still pretty young. He's 21 years old. And most of these tackles, uh, you know, the only one that's 22 uh, in that top group is Fuaga. Uh, and then Coleman, the, the ninth guy, um, is is 23. Uh, Patrick Paul's 22. But of the the first round guys, uh, Talisi Fuaga, like, just turned 22. Um, so they're all fairly young players. Some of them have have four years of experience, um, but most of them, even if they're listed as like fourth year players, fourth year juniors because they redshirted, et cetera, um, they are uh, they they don't have a lot of of tape. Um, and so I'll just go through them one by one. Um, Joe Alt, obviously, if for some reason he falls. It probably means there's like a medical or something, um, and so that that would be weird. But everyone thinks that he's going to uh, Tennessee at seven. Uh, if not, he certainly would get scooped up before the Commanders could even trade up with without including like a future first rounder. Fashanu from Penn State, super duper uh, athlete. He, you know, Dane's uh, ultimate takeaway is. Work in progress as a run blocker, but above average in pass protection because of his body quickness, anchor versus power, and attention to detail. He projects as a long-term starting left tackle in the NFL with Pro Bowl upside. Um, Logan has some technique gripes with him, um, but it's also like it was interesting talking to Golick because Golick like liked his technique, and it just comes from you know Mike played at Notre Dame and learned a certain way. Logan prefers a different type of thing, and that actually made me feel better about Fashinu. Because I'm like, well, if they just want to change his technique, it's they can change it. Um, he's got great hands. He's got great feet. There's a lot to like there, even if there's some technique issues and you have some questions in terms of tightness in his hips and ankles that might not ever resolve. 
But if that's a technique issue and you can just be like, hey, dude, uh, do it this way. And all of a sudden his whole body uh, becomes available to him from a fluidity standpoint and athleticism standpoint, you're you're in good shape. Okay, so then the next guy is J.C. Latham from uh, Alabama. Uh, Dane Brugler's overall takeaway, Latham needs to clean up his inconsistent uh, yet fixable habits but he offers elite play strength and functional football movements to stay square and overmatch his opponent. He's an ascending prospect with the talent to win a starting right tackle job as an NFL rookie, although some teams project him inside at guard. So, J.C. Latham, right tackler guard, not interested. This is going to sound familiar in a second when we get to Talisi Fuaga. Fuaga has only average play range and can be dinged here and there for minor flaws, but he has the size, core strength, and balance to be a plug-and-play starter in the NFL, reminiscent of Taylor Decker, who is, of course, a right tackle. Some teams view him best inside at guard, while others want to keep him at right tackle. Duke Mainweather compares him to Mike Ayupati. So, he's either a guard or a right tackle, and he's a guy that's played a bunch on the right side, and because of that experience, it actually probably makes it harder than some of these other guys who haven't played a ton to flip him to the left. So now you're talking about, okay, is Amarius Mims that guy? Um, Mims has only played, of course, famously, eight games. That's it. Eight games worth of football. Uh, or, or eight starts worth of football, I should say. Um, he missed six games because of a left ankle injury uh, last year. Uh, his first two starts ever came in the college football playoff in 2022. Um, overall, Mims isn't as far along fundamentally, especially in the run game, as other tackles in the class. But he's a natural in pass protection with above average length footwork and body twitch to handle different type of edge rushers. Though there is projection involved with his draft grade, his best football is ahead of him, and he has the talent to become a long-term starter at left or right tackle. So, Amarius Mims... Not someone because he's barely played and it's such a projection that I'm willing to give up 36 and 44, but someone that if he falls into the 20s, I would be willing to look at. Then Tyler Guyton's the last guy under consideration here. Went to Oklahoma, good pedigree there. Um, he played right tackle. He played left tackle. Um, he also came into Oklahoma as a tight end, or sorry, uh, to TCU as a tight end and then converted to tackle when he got to Oklahoma. So we're talking about a monster athlete here. Um, Guyton is a work in progress in several areas, and a steep learning curve should be expected for his rookie season. But he has the athletic tools and fundamental skills to develop into a high-level offensive tackle. He has the talent to play left or right tackle, although his comfort level is clearly on the right side. As long as he stays motivated and healthy, he will continue an upward trajectory. So, Ant. Of those guys that I just read off, are there any of them, and especially when we talk about Mims and Guyton, right? Because those are the two that are most likely to fall. But I'll even put uh, Fashanu in there. When you hear someone who likes them all in Brugler be like, hey, here's the risk, does it sound smart to trade up for that and, and sacrifice two picks for that one guy? I think it boils down to whether or not if you're going to embrace actually, you know, coaching these players up. Um, again, like a lot of the technique and, and, and things, footwork, that's all like coaching, to be honest. And uh, Mike Tomlin, he actually was on, I think it was LeBron James' podcast, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was The Pivot. I, the I think pivot. I know the quote you're talking about. It was on yeah. Ryan Clark's show, yeah. It's like you, you really got to embrace like uh, coaching. And we, we see that, you know, the Steelers do a great job of that. I can't necessarily say – the commanders have done that uh, the last couple of years. Uh, we've had our players out of position and things of that nature. So I think it just boils down to like whether or not you trust um, your coaching staff to you know be able to develop these guys. And if that's the case, then I guess we don't necessarily have to bank on you know sacrificing two picks for the sake of one. Um, so that's what I think it like just boils down. Yeah, to. I mean, so I would say I would I would half agree with you because. It is about coaching, right? If you're the Tennessee Titans and you have Bill Callahan, who famously I love and think has never done anything wrong. That's an inside joke for longtime listeners to the show. Um, <laughs> Callahan's awesome. He's an unbelievable O-line coach. And if I have Bill Callahan, or if I'm Philly, and I have Jeff Stoutland, yeah, I'm okay. But here's the thing. I'm also willing to take one of the projects later 
and feel like I can get more out of them than maybe a more talented guy with a lesser O-line coach. But it also comes down to the person, right? Because it is coaching, but it also is on the athlete himself to Mm -hmm. do the work. So that's where I half agree with you, is the other half is the athlete. So you have to know and scout the person. And not that I have anything negative to say about Tyler Guyton or Marius Mims or Olu Fashanu, but if they are that risky as prospects... If we're work, if we're planned on that much development to make it work, well, why would I try to put all my eggs in one basket if I can take someone who maybe is a slightly bigger risk in a Patrick Ball, a Kingsley Suamatia, a Roger Rosengarten, and say we'll take that guy and also get an edge, a wide receiver, a corner, a whoever's the best player on the board at that other pick. To me, that's where I've ultimately landed here is I do think Mims is probably worth it if you don't have to give up 36 and 40. If you can give up, especially if it's like 36 and 100, I think that's worth it because Mims might wind up being the best tackle in this class. Guyton is super interesting because he's a freak athlete and they just don't make a lot of athletes like that. And he's so raw and so inexperienced, but has shown an aptitude to learn that I think you, if you're, if you have confidence in your O-line coach, if they have confidence in Bobby Johnson, then they should think about that. But ultimately, I don't know how much better he is than a Jordan Morgan from Arizona, than a Sue Matia. Um, but again, there's questions about those guys too. Sue Matia transferred because he was homesick. Do you trust him? And that was from Oregon to BYU. Imagine going from uh, Utah to Washington D.C. Um, Jordan Morgan. A lot of people think he's a guard. Uh, Patrick Paul, rawer than hell. Like, just super-duper raw, crazy athlete, crazy measurables. Men that big aren't supposed to move that fast and have that much strength uh, and, and have it all be fluid and, and such. But he's might not be that good of an actual tackle. So, like, this is, the, this is why this is so damn hard. And yet, teams trade up and do this kind of stuff all the time, which is the subject of a piece today in The Athletic by Alec Lewis. We'll talk to Alec coming up at 5 o'clock, but your calls on this Vibe Check Tuesday. We're nine days from the NFL draft. Where are you on what the commanders need? Do you think they should trade up into the first round? Uh, They've got two seconds, three-thirds. Should they package some amount of them if they can try and get up into the first round? Um, What Kind of funny, some of the, the YouTube... Uh, comments. Uh, we do have uh, people that are in favor. Um, R. Young says got, get Tyler Guyton at 23. Uh, that's, of course, the pick that Minnesota currently owns. Most people think they won't own it by the time that that pick gets on the clock because they'll trade up uh, into the top five and take a quarterback, which is going to involve giving up that pick. Um, Daniel Holland says if you won't uh, have a day one starting O lineman, you have to trade up. It's going to be a run on them. Um, and I would say I disagree with that. I don't think that you have to. Cornelius Lucas can start for you day one. I don't want him starting for me by the middle of the season, potentially. But I also don't know that anybody you draft is going to be better than Cornelius Lucas by week one. Um, unless you get alt. Uh, but there's no chance, uh, there's no promise that any of those other guys uh, would be. Which is why Silver Fox says, stay put at 36 and 40 and draft a left tackle and either an edge, cornerback, or wide receiver. Uh, that is my two sense and then we have some people who don't understand the prompt here uh and are asking about trading up uh at number two that's that's not what we're what we're talking about here we're not talking about that pick but that's okay uh 301-230-0980 is the phone number uh let's go to the phones uh let's go to emory emory thanks for calling you are on the hoffman show what's up Craig? what's up emory What's happening, man? Hey, listen, I'm with you on this one, man. Uh, if we can't get uh, Fuago or Fashanu, one of them, I say stay put. Because everybody else, to me, is hit or miss. Latham, I'm not convinced. Guyton, I'm not convinced. Um, Kingsley Sue I think he might, he might have a chance to drop to the second round. My real question is, can they be better than Charles Leno um, once they come? And if they can't, there's no reason to trade back up. I think we stay put. We get somebody in the early second round. Any other year, it would be like a late first rounder. So um, as long as we develop them, we should be in a good position. 
Yeah, Emery, thanks for the call. Um, I agree with that. I mean, Leno obviously gone, and Charles, I mean, even if they had decided to keep him for whatever other reasons, he wasn't going to be available week one because he had surgery this offseason, um, which motivates them in part to move on. He had great things to say. I mean, he might be looking at retirement. Um, he, he was on with Kime, and it was a really, really good inter- interview um, with Charles Leno uh, talking about how impressed he was with the new regime, even though they let him go as one of their first, uh, their first moves. So... I think that obviously Cornelius Lucas is penciled into the starter right now. Trent Scott uh, is right there with him and doing better than that should not be terribly hard. I also think the important thing to remember is there are guys available currently that, that could, you could bring in post draft. Like I don't think Bakhtiari signed anywhere. Um, There are some other vets that are out there, obviously Tyron signed, uh, but there are some veterans that if you want to try to stop gap it for a year or just bring in another option that you could probably even sign in training camp um, that don't necessarily need camp, but that that could be helpful for you. So I, I think that that lack of need, the lack of urgency is a good thing. Um, and you're not going to fix every problem in one year. You know, you might wind up next year, let's say they, they get better and they have the 10th pick, and now next year you can get a premier offensive tackle at 10. Like, that's that'd be smart. Um you know, I think that there's a lot of things you can do here because you have a long view. And again, this is something we're going to talk about with Alec Lewis. When you look at his piece, like, if anything, if you could package some of those picks for a future first or a future something, those those things tend to pay off. You want to package two of your thirds for a future second. Like, teams, for some reason, do that stuff, and it doesn't actually work out in the long term. The, the future picks are so undervalued. So there's a lot of things to consider uh, for Washington uh, and that we might not even be thinking about right now. But I think when you do think about this particular tackle class, there's enough guys that either, like there's kind of two two player profiles for the second round. You can either take the big swing for a guy like Patrick Paul. And who knows, maybe Guyton falls into the second round. Maybe it just works out that the right amount of guys fall in the right places and you know, someone falls in love with Brock Bowers and that knocks a tackle down and someone else falls in love with Cooper DeGene and that knocks a tackle down that we didn't see coming. Or there's, there's you know, a run on wide receivers or corners instead of tackles and somebody fo- slips that, that we're not expecting, whether it be a Marius Mims, that one feels crazy, but crazy things have happened. Um, Tyler Guyton, like, who knows? Maybe one of those guys does wind up falling up in, even if it's to 28 and that costs you way less than getting to 23, nevertheless 18, or God forbid, you know, they make it out of the first round, you'd call Carolina and you go, hey, we'll give you 36 and, you know, 150, whatever, something in the fifth, sixth round this year to move up four spots, and we're going to take that guy with the first pick of the second round or you don't even you know that hey you know the Raiders are going to trade up and take Michael Penix with the first pick of the second round or like you you know where you got to go and it's not that far and once you get out of the first round you barely have to give anything up to move um, that is that's a great potential option as well but the the larger point here is who is worth that trade up is is probably like that list isn't very long. And if you want to even not take a big swing, and to what I was saying, there's kind of two player types. You know, you have your your big swings, your Marius Mims, your Tyler Guytons, and then the more risky versions of the high upside guys in like Patrick Paul. But you also do have Roger Rosengarten out of Washington who can probably step in and be a day one starter in the NFL. His just his upside's not that good. So you'd essentially be trying to like you you'd have like another Andrew Wiley type, which I know horrifies everybody. Um, but Andrew Wiley is a good football player. The problem is he's not a great football player. Um, and so in the second round, are you willing to draft a guy that is a legitimate NFL starter, but is never going to be a really good NFL starter? And I would say most people would probably lean towards taking the bigger swing. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.